Welcome to our second Great Decisions program. Uh, my name is Rick Kilroy. I teach in the Department of Politics here at Coastal Carolina. And um, unfortunately, Elizabeth could not travel to be with us this weekend, but she graciously agreed to do our, our talk by uh, video teleconferencing, so we appreciate her taking time to do that. Just uh, again to remind everybody a little bit about the dynamics of our program is that uh, Elizabeth will talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take a break. And at that point in time, if you do have questions for her, uh, there are cards in the back. You can write those out. And then, like last week, I'll do a moderated Q&A, so I'll try to combine as many questions as I can to get them, get them asked of her. I'm excited to have Elizabeth speak with us this morning. I, just a little bit of a background is that um, you might not be aware of the fact that we take students up to Washington, D.C. in a program we're calling National Intelligence Studies in Washington, D.C. And um, it's evolved from a, what began as a spring break chip uh, to now a summer program uh, where we take students up for three weeks, uh, visit a number of the different intelligence agencies, but they also visit uh, colleges, universities in the Washington area to learn about graduate programs related to our field of study. Uh, and we also take them to think tanks. And um, a couple years ago, we uh, visited the Stimson Center and had a chance to meet with their analysts uh, working in different areas of the world, particularly in, in South Asia. And last year, uh, we met with Elizabeth up in Washington, D.C., since one of the topics our students were researching on that trip were India-Pakistan relations. So when I saw that as a great decision topic, I immediately reached out to Elizabeth to see if she would uh, be willing to speak with our program this morning because of her, the wealth of her background and knowledge on this topic. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and have one of our students come up, uh, Laura Howell. She is a uh, intelligence and national security studies major uh, who is also taking uh, the great decisions class that we offer here at Coastal, which is a combination of, of supporting the program here uh, February, and then we do the other four topics in the book uh, in an online format. So, Laura, please come on up and introduce Elizabeth. Yes. All right. So, uh, today I'll be introducing you to our speaker. So, Elizabeth Threckold is a fellow and deputy director of the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. Before joining Stimson, she served as a foreign service officer and with the U.S. Department of State in Islamabad and Peshawar, Pakistan, and Monterey, Mexico. Threlkeld previously worked in the Kurdish region of northern Iraq, where she managed developmental interventions on gender-based violence and ethno-sectarian reconciliation. She has additional work and educational experience in China, Taiwan, and Turkey, and began her career with the Asia-Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. She holds a Master's in Philosophy in Politics and International Relations from the University of Cambridge, where she received the Hilda Richardson Studentship from Newnham College. In her dissertation, she analyzed political and security dynamics, driving the development of governance reforms in Pakistan's western border region. She received a Bachelor of Arts with high honors in sociology and anthropology from Swarthmore College. Her research interests include South Asian geopolitics, ethno-nationalist conflict, and territorial disputes. She is the recipient of a Department of State Superior Honor Award, several meritorious honor awards, and the Matilda W. Sinclair Language Award. She speaks Pashto, Mandarin, and Spanish. Now, would you all please join me in welcoming Ms. Elizabeth Threlkeld. Okay, fingers crossed. I'm gonna switch over now to my presentation. Um, you guys are gonna see this look really quick. So thank you for your patience. Um, technology didn't exactly cooperate, but we made it work, hopefully. Um, so again, just thanks to Rick and Laura and Chris and Ken for their uh, heroics in making this happen and, and inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be able to speak with you all. Um, I hadn't heard of the Great Decisions Program before. Rick emailed and, and asked me to do this, but it looks like a really interesting way of um, giving a tone into a lot of different hot spots around the world. Um, so what I'm going to try to do a little bit today is talk about the Kashmir crisis um, and what's going on these days between India and Pakistan, but try to put it in a broader context um, and talk a bit about, from my perspective at least, why it should be an issue that policymakers here in Washington are paying attention to. Uh, before I do that, though, I wanted to give a brief introduction to the place I worked, um, the Simpson Center, the Henry L. Simpson Center in Washington, D.C. Um, as Rick mentioned, 
their students visit in the summer and it was really a pleasure to get to talk to them um, and host them here at St. Tony. But I imagine some of you might not be too familiar with uh, what they tend to do and their role in the policy process here in Washington. So I did want to talk about that a little bit. So let me give you a roadmap for today's talk. Hopefully it's a little smaller. All right. So first, I'm going to give an overview of the Extension Center and the program that I work for here called South Asia Program. I'm going to give context on the Kashmir dispute and the India Pakistan conflict more broadly. I'll talk about some recent decisions that have been made and their impact, as well as reactions from other states across the region. I'll look forward for a little bit um, and see where we might end up six months, a year, uh, more than that down the road, and then try to draw out some broader implications from this conversation, including for U.S. policy. Um, I'll try to do that in about 30 minutes now, since we lost some time with audio. Um, so there's a lot to cover, and I appreciate your attention. So before we dive in, um, I imagine many of you in the room will remember Henry L. Stinson. Um, and he was chosen as the namesake of the Ascension Center when it was founded in 1989. So this was the end of the Cold War. Um, my two co-founders, Barry Blackman and Michael Crapon, wanted to take stock of what had been learned during the Cold War, particularly about nuclear and strategic issues, and think through how we could apply those lessons learned to other parts of the world. Um, and that includes South Asia, the, the program that I was working on. We showed Henry L. Stenson as a namesake because he was known for his classical and bipartisan approach. So he is the only official still um, who has served as both Secretary of State and at the time Secretary of War. And he did so under both Democratic and Republican administration. And that was the spirit of public service and pragmatism and bipartisan leadership that they wanted to capture in the center and try to build an organization um, that would look at foreign policy issues through that lens. So our unofficial model around here is that we look for pragmatic steps towards ideal objectives, which was one of the um, famous videos. So we cover not just South Asia, um, but programs across Asia, actually. We have a program on, on North Korea, on China, on Southeast Asia, on South Asia. And we have a number of programs that are focused on nuclear issues, on arms control, um, on environmental security, um, on atrocity prevention, on UN peacekeeping efforts. So we work on a wide range of issues, um, and we were very fortunate and honored in 2013 to receive the MacArthur Genius Award um, for a creative and effective institution. Um, so I feel very, very fortunate to have wound up at the Henry Stenson Center after I left the Department of State. Um, and it's been a really great place to be able to do not just traditional research work, um, which we certainly do a lot of, but we also implement programs um, through the South Asia program. So I'll briefly introduce you to some of the programs that we work on. So um, this is Spence in South Asia. There are 10 of us. It's a South Asia program that has been around for quite a while in DC. Um, about 25 years at this point, and we do a mix of research on crises and nuclear issues and politics in the region, and we also try to do not just a think tank, but also a new thing. So we are doing online courses on nuclear issues and deterrence in South Asia, um, so that's our nuclear learning initiative. SAV that you'll see there next to it stands for South Asian Voices, and it's an online policy platform that brings in up-and-coming analysts from the region, so folks from India and Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, 
um, and gives them a platform to write for a policy audience. Um, and what we try to do there is create a conversation about important issues that goes across borders. Uh, so you don't have as much of the echo chamber effect, but you actually have analysts writing to each other and, and talking directly in that way and engaging on these important issues. We also publish book link works. Um, our most recent one is called Offense from Confrontation in Southern Asia. And it's a collection of ideas for how India and Pakistan can more productively um, move away from conflict. There's been, as we'll discuss, decades um, of conflict between the two sides. And this book just puts out useful, pragmatic recommendations for small ways that we can reduce the chance of catastrophic, catastrophic conflict in South Asia. Um, and then on the bottom right, those are our visiting fellows. So those are four regional analysts. Um, we have two from Pakistan and two from India. Um, and they were with us for two months last summer. Um, this is a year-long fellowship that we have where we bring up-and-coming analysts from the region to Washington, D.C. They spend two months with us in residence at the Stenson Center. They work on research. They go to meetings with U.S. government officials and think tanks and academics. Um, and they work on research projects. Um, they work in collaboration with each other. And it's a really rich way of, um, for us, building relationships with some dynamic and, and brilliant people from the region, um, but also just sharing perspectives across borders. Um, so we're very proud of that program as well. So all that is to say, in addition to kind of the standard, what you might expect is Ivy Tower research, uh, which we do a bit of, we're also in the region. Um, we travel very regularly. I was actually just in India and Singapore for two weeks in January, um, which was a wonderful trip, and I'll, I'll reflect on some of what I learned then as well today. Um, so without further ado, let's dive into the topic at hand. So Kashmir and its place in the India-Pakistan rivalry. Um, the question that was teed up for me to try to answer today, um, which I will do my best at, although it's a big one. Um, I know that you all received the, the summary of what's going on in, in India-Pakistan relations and Kashmir's role in it. Um, but the question I will address is how will the Kashmir situation affect the region, both economically and politically? So to do that, I'm going to try to go back a little bit in history uh, and talk about how the situation in Kashmir emerged, how we got to where we are today, um, and try to put it in a broader context between India and Pakistan. So in terms of the importance of this issue, you know, why are we talking about Kashmir to begin with? Um, I think it's important to, rec to recognize that there are over 12 million people who live within Kashmir. Um, and as much as the region is seen through a security lens and the lens of territorial competition, what happens there directly impacts on the lives of those 12 million people. Um, and so I think it's important to keep them front and center in our minds. The other thing that I would say, though, is that Kashmir is the very center of the dispute between India and Pakistan. Um, and India and Pakistan, as I'm sure you all know, are two states with nuclear weapons who, in their history, have fought four wars. Um, and Kashmir has been the center of at least three of those wars. So, in that context, what happens in Kashmir matters not only for the 12 million people who live there, but unfortunately could also have much broader, more catastrophic consequences if we were to see a crisis in Kashmir that could potentially escalate to the nuclear level. Um, and that's a lot of what my program at Stenson works on, is trying to find ways of supporting um, what we call strategic stability in South Asia. So, as I mentioned, um, it's a territory that India and Pakistan have fought three wars over. So, 1947, 1965, and 1999. It is an ethnically diverse 
piece of territory, um, and it's also renowned for its beauty. So there's this myth about Kashmir being a Switzerland of Asia, um, and it's seen as a beautiful place, a peaceful place. Um, it's also um, a tourist destination. Um, many uh, folks from the region and also internationally travel to Kashmir for its beauty. Um, it's composed of three subregions. So the Muslim majority Kashmir Valley, which has 6.8 million people, the Hindu majority Jammu region, which has 5.4 million people, and Ladakh, which has 300,000 people. It's much more uh, sparsely populated, and it's 46% Buddhist. So the history of Kashmir and how it came to be this um, contested area. Um, so during the period of decolonization, when Britain was exiting the region, states like Kashmir had the ability to choose whether they would join India or Pakistan. And Kashmir was in a strange situation because it was a Muslim-majority region, but its leader was Hindu. And so it was kind of torn in between the two sides. Um, and originally, it, it wanted to sit on the fence and actually was more interested in independence and being its own state than in joining either of the two. But in 1947, there was an influx of invading fighters coming across the border from Pakistan. And in order to secure protection from India, uh, the leader of Kashmir agreed to join uh, the Indian state. So that was a very controversial decision. And in the war that followed between India and Pakistan, it actually ended in 1949 when both sides signed the UN agreement creating a ceasefire line between the two. So the territory of Kashmir was split between India and Pakistan. Um, that was the status quo that continued um, despite a recommendation that was in that agreement that there be a, what was called a plebiscite. So a vote within Kashmir to decide whether its residents wanted to join India or join Pakistan. That plebiscite never happened. Um, and so the situation as it was in 1949 became the status quo. That changed a bit in 1963 when there was an agreement between uh, Pakistan and China to cede part of the area that Pakistan claimed of Kashmir to China. And that became known as Aksai Chin. So now we have a third player in the mix as well. In 1965, India and Pakistan fought, fought another war over Kashmir. This was inconclusive um, and ended in another UN-mandated ceasefire. In 1971, um, what was then known as East Pakistan broke off from the main part of Pakistan and became the country that is today Bangladesh. Um, so that was a very fraught moment for the state in Pakistan. And if we fast forward to 1972 then, the agreement that was reached between India and Pakistan at the end of that war, um, called the Shimla Agreement, created what's known as the line of control. Um, and that might be a term that some of you are familiar with. It is the de facto border uh, between India and Pakistan running through the Kashmir region today. So what was created in 1972 still stands. It's still for the facto border. Um, and in fact, India in some areas has put up a fence um, hardening the border between both sides. Within Kashmir itself, um, starting in about 1987 with a rigged election, there started to be a domestic insurgency. Um, it drew in former fighters who were coming across from the war in Afghanistan against the Soviets um, and Pakistan sponsored some of these insurgents to go into Kashmir and try to create an uprising there um, to win the independence of Kashmir and to bring it over to the Pakistani side. That continued throughout the 1990s um, and tapered off a bit in the 2000s. But two other key dates to keep in mind, so in 1998, that was the date when both India and then Pakistan conducted nuclear tests. 
So both sides had been rumored for a while to have nuclear weapons, but it wasn't until 1998 that they both tested. And so this turned into not just a conventional conflict, but potentially a nuclear conflict. And then in 1999, the two sides, one year after um, unveiling their nuclear weapons, fought a limited war in an area of the, of the disputed region called Cargill. Um, it's actually a glacier, so this is one of the highest altitude wars that's ever been fought. Um, and it resulted largely in a standstill, um, but again, a really troubling demonstration of how high tensions are between both sides, and particularly now that nuclear weapons are involved. So, this is a map of the area that we're talking about. Um, you can see in the orange color there, that's the area of Kashmir that is administered by India. The area in the green is administered by Pakistan, and the area in kind of the, the tannish gray color is administered by China. Um, it is deeply at the center of a lot of attention in the region, and there have been attempts over the years to try to negotiate and end the conflict, but it hasn't come to much at this point. Unfortunately, it, it's still a very tense situation. So that brings us up to present day. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened on August 5th of last year. So if you all read in the summary information, the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi of the BJP was re-elected this uh, last spring. And one of his first major initiatives was on August 5th when he did two things his government announced the revocation of Constitutional Article 370 and of Article 35A. That sounds a little dry, um, but what it means in practice um, is that Article 370 was originally intended to be a temporary part of the Constitution, um, but it had held, and it had given the region pretty significant autonomy, so it had its own constitution, it had a separate flag, it had independence over all domestic matters except for foreign affairs, defense, and communications. Now, realistically, that had been pulled back a bit over the years. Um, what was guaranteed on paper in Article 370 wasn't actually the lived reality that, that people in Kashmir were seeing in terms of autonomy. But the outright revocation of the article was deeply symbolic for the region um, and was a, a pretty fraught move. So Article 35A was an article that had guaranteed the Kashmir region the ability to determine who was a permanent resident of Kashmir. And so it limited, for example, the ability to purchase land, um, to pursue education, those sorts of issues, and the intent, what it effectively did, was ensure that the Kashmiri population within Kashmir was able to um, remain the majority, so to own land, to pursue education and job opportunities, because there's a fear that without that article in place, others from elsewhere in India would flood into Kashmir, uh, would buy up land, and that's a deeply troubling prospect for what would then be a Kashmiri minority in their own region. So the way the Indian government did this, knowing that it was going to be a very controversial move, is with very little notice, uh, there was an influx of more security forces in the region. Kashmir is already um, one of, if not the most heavily secured areas in the world. So you hear between um, one security force member to every eight or every 10 Kashmiris, which is a very, very high ratio. But they brought in even more security forces to the region. They put Kashmir's political leadership under house arrest. Um, so thousands were jailed. Um, there was a curfew that was imposed. The internet, phone, and cable TV were shut down. and life really came to a standstill. Um, so it was, even though the BJP, the party, had actually 
broadcast its intent to take these steps in its election manifesto. Um, so they say that they were merely carrying out the will of the people of India uh, because they had been reelected to the mandate. The way that this group um, carried out, I think, was particularly controversial and just very sudden in Kashmir. So what has happened since then? Around the region, the reaction within India, um, the way that they justified this controversial move was based on development. So the Indian government said that it was actually these special con constitutional provisions that were keeping back development from Kashmir, that investment from the rest of the country couldn't flow into the region, and that was holding back development outcomes. And so by removing the autonomy provisions and bringing Kashmir into the main body of India, they would actually be furthering its development. Um, so these moves were in approved by India's parliament, and they're currently under review of the Supreme Court. Although it's widely expected that the Supreme Court will um, will not reverse the move um, in Kashmir, so since then there was quite a bit of international pushback um, towards India's move in Kashmir, and particularly on human rights grounds um, that it was effectively cut off from the rest of the world. Some of you might have seen coverage in mainstream U.S. and international newspapers. Um, with these pretty eerie photos of shut down. There was some limited protests that broke out, but the security forces presence was so strong that we didn't actually see as much protesting as some analysts had predicted when this was um, came into effect. So since then, really in the last couple of months, we started to see a slow reinstatement of connectivity. So that means some internet is restored, but only at very slow speeds, and also only a certain number of websites are allowed. Um, so it's, to the extent that it's con uh, restored, it's a very controlled version of the internet. Um, they certainly don't have the ability to access every website that they might want to. There's also been a release of some of the political prisoners within Kashmir, but again, the leaders of the main parties remain under house arrest, and actually those detentions were just suspended um, within India, because we've just passed six months since August 5th when these decisions were made. In terms of economic and investment opportunities in Kashmir, um, there's a great deal of uncertainty right now. So India itself is in the midst of an economic slowdown, and if you'll remember, one of the justifications for why this decision was made was based on development. And so an investment conference that had been planned for last October um, to kind of herald the, the, the influx of the development to the region had to be postponed. Um, and it's supposedly going to be held again this spring, but one of the things that we heard on our recent trip was that even that was in doubt. So the, the broader justification on development grounds that the autonomy laws have prevented investment, um, I think, remains in doubt at this point. As you all also probably read in the summary, so this is not the only policy that the Narendra Modi government has taken since being reelected. Um, it's part of a broader domestic agenda that includes what's called the NRC, the National Register of Citizens, um, and the CAA as well. And those are two amendments, um, the CAA, the Citizenship Act Amendment. Um, and what it does is it allows refugees from surrounding areas, from surrounding countries, um, who arrive before a certain date to establish residence and become citizens of India, um, but it applies to every minority group except for Muslims. And so that's been highly controversial in terms of its discriminatory approach on the basis of religion. The NRC, meanwhile, is a program that is intended to identify undocumented immigrants. 
um, across India. It's been implemented in one state so far, and up to two million individuals were unable to establish their citizenship in India. They didn't have records dating back long enough to do that. Um, and so those are both very controversial social policies that outside observers say are trying to um, recreate the democratic demographic balance in India and are privileging Hindus and other religious groups over Muslims. Um, and India does have a significant Muslim minority of around 200 million people. Um, and so in general, India is very focused right now in work. So on these social policies, on managing the fallout of some pretty controversial decisions. Across the LOC uh, in Pakistan, so LOC again is one of the control, they have largely adopted more of a diplomatic approach towards the decision that, that were taken in Kashmir. Um, we've seen a diplomatic response to the UN where with the assistance of China, um, Pakistan was able to bring Kashmir back to the agenda of the UN Security Council for the first time in several decades. Uh, there was a meeting that took place, place shortly after this decision was announced in August. And that was seen as a diplomatic victory for Pakistan because it brought Kashmir back to international attention. Um, Within Pakistan, there has been widespread opposition to revocation, and I'll show you all a poll on the next slide that, that documents that. Um, but there is a greater focus really on other issues. So pocketbook issues are huge in Pakistan, which is also facing an economic crisis at the moment. One thing that I have heard from friends and, and contacts in Pakistan is just the anger. Um, that really comes out about this decision. It was seen through the Pakistan perspective of India violating its agreement. Uh, those that were signed in 1972, for example, uh, that any sort of next steps in Kashmir, any resolution to the issue, would have to be worked out bilaterally between India and Pakistan. And Pakistan views this move that India took in Kashmir as violating that agreement because the Pakistanis weren't consulted. It was something that India did without announcing it, without um, any sort of negotiations between the two sides. And so the Pakistanis argue that, that India is in violation of its international agreement. I think it's important to point out, though, what we haven't seen so far which there has not been a military response, um, and nor have we seen any militant group attack um, so far, despite significant pressure. So over the years, Pakistan has harbored proxy groups that carry out attacks in Indian administered Kashmir, and this has been kind of the spark of a lot of crises between the two sides. And particularly given the importance of Kashmir to those groups, it is pretty surprising um, that we haven't seen those sorts of attacks since this decision was announced in August 5th. And I think that should be recognized and does speak to the efforts of Imran Khan and others in Pakistan to settle this through diplomatic channels rather than through military or militant channels. So let's take a quick look at those two polls that I uh, was mentioning. So you all can read this. This is the question that was asked. Um, basically asking Pakistan's population soon after um, the decision on August 5th was announced, to what extent do you condemn this act? So obviously an overwhelming majority, 95% of Pakistanis condemn the abolition abolition of Kashmir's special status, 87% condemn a lot, 8% condemn somewhat. Um, and I think that speaks to the overwhelming opposition that we saw within Pakistan to this announcement. But there's a caveat. So later in that same month in October, people were asked, in your opinion, what is the biggest problem faced by Pakistan these days? Three general questions. And you'll see down on the left side, 
only 8% said the Kashmir issue. Um, economic concerns were dominant, we saw. 53% were concerned about inflation, 23% about unemployment, 4% on corruption, and a variety of other issues on the right side. And so in terms of what's really driving the concerns um, of Pakistani citizens day in and day out, it does seem to be the economy right now as opposed to the kind of more salient political issue of, of opposition to India's moves in Kashmir. Going further west, regional reactions in Afghanistan. So really, what I say both sides here, I mean the Afghan government and the Taliban. Um, interestingly, both are just trying to stay out of prey. Um, so Afghan, Afghanistan's government released a statement calling the situation in Kashmir a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan. Um, and the Taliban, interestingly, also released a statement calling for restraint from both sides um, and for the international community to be attentive to the situation. And I think within Afghanistan as well, there's a lot of sympathy for the Kashmiri cause. Um, to Muslim-majority areas, um, Kashmir has typically been not as much as in Pakistan, but it is at least according to anecdotal reports, an important issue for people on the ground in Afghanistan. But to see both the government and the Taliban actually on the same side about this issue was pretty interesting. Um, the last point there, so explicit reputation of Pakistani statements. What that, what that is referring to is that one way that Pakistan responded diplomatically after this move was announced was that um, it said publicly that the situation in Kashmir would make it more difficult for Pakistan to continue playing the role that it's playing right now in Afghan peace negotiations. So Pakistan is widely credited with bringing the Taliban to the table, and Pakistan's leadership said basically, we're going to be less able to do that because we're paying more attention to what's going on in Kashmir. And so in that, there was kind of an implicit threat that if the U.S. really wants um, the Afghan war to be resolved, it needed to pay attention to Kashmir in the process, too. So Afghanistan was trying to really just separate itself from the Kashmir issue. Finally, in terms of regional reactions on the Chinese side, so as I mentioned, China does have some skin in the game here um, through the Oxide Chin region that it does claim. Um, but it's also been fairly restrained in its response, I would say. So it released a statement uh, accusing India of, quote, undermining China's territorial sovereignty with this decision. Um, and one way that it supported Pakistan's diplomatic efforts was by helping it to bring the issue in front of the UN Security Council, because um, obviously China has a great deal of weight in the UN. But really since then, um, China has also tried to stay out of any sort of potential conflict over Kashmir. Now that we've kind of surveyed the region, um, I'm going to look forward a bit in terms of what we can expect going forward. So six months on, just a little bit over by a couple of days, things really have been surprisingly quiet. Um, there were some predictions by analysts in Washington and elsewhere that this was going to spark another cycle of violence within Kashmir and also between India and Pakistan. I think the question that we need to pay attention to going forward is what happens when the restrictions that are still in place in Kashmir are ultimately lifted. Um, we imagine that over the next several months, India will likely continue to release some political prisoners, continue to restore connectivity to the region, and particularly when spring arrives, because right now there's so much snow in Kashmir that traditionally not much happens in terms of protests or violence over the winter. But when things thaw out in the spring, that could change. Um, and another kind of connected but um, maybe unexpected piece of this is 
if we are to see a settlement between the U.S. and the Taliban in Afghanistan, that is going to be a major propaganda victory for the Taliban and will likely also um, inspire militant groups across the region. And so if we are to see something along those lines this spring, that could play a significant role in driving a narrative of resistance within Kashmir. So one of the things that my team here at the Simpson Center has been focusing on are what are the implications of this decision for crisis dynamics in South Asia and specifically between India and Pakistan. So this is fairly clear that the high tensions between both sides could raise the risk of conflict in the region. Um, one thing that we've also seen is both sides might be looking to shift blame. So there are economic challenges that are going on internally between both sides. Um, and politically, it's, it's in the interest of both to paint in Pakistan towards India and vice versa um, as the aggressor. And so that is a dangerous dynamic in general. What we say, domestic audience pressure for escalation. So what that basically means is the slide that I was showing of the polling numbers. So particularly, I would say, if we are to see protests break out in the Kashmir region or, or violence up to bed, um, especially in Pakistan, there could be a great deal of pressure, maybe even protests by groups that see what's going on in Kashmir and are calling on Pakistan's military to take action, and that could be a very dangerous dynamic. In the next point, a chance of a non-traditional crisis trigger. So let's think tank speak, but what it basically means is usually the way that India-Pakistan crises have started um, is that there will be a terrorist attack either in India itself or in India that the Indian government attributes to terrorist groups that are harbored by Pakistan um, and are allegedly directed by Pakistan. That is a crisis trigger that we've seen play out a number of times, including most recently in February of last year. Um, what this raises the prospect of, though, is that there could be a different kind of trigger that could start a crisis between both sides. So it could be genuine domestic um, insurgent violence within Kashmir. It could be some sort of communal violence which, within India, um, for example, between the Muslim and Hindu communities. And if we are to see a situation like that, it could be even more dangerous between both sides because there wouldn't be as clear a choreography. Um, one side does this, the other side does this, kind of uncharted territory in that way. And then the last point I think is really important, that given China's role in the region, its claim in Kashmir, and also the close relationship that China and Pakistan have, it becomes more involved in future crises. Um, it has a stake not only in the Kashmir region, but also in protecting the investments that it has made through what's called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, in Pakistan. And so that's just another player and another different dynamic that we could see play out. So in terms of geopolitics here, India really, like I was saying earlier, is more focused on its domestic situation. So not just what's going on in Kashmir, but the protests that we've seen break out over the, the NRC and the CAA, the two laws that I was mentioning that have come into effect. They're focused more on maintaining security than they are on the bigger picture. So the U.S.-India relationship, the partnership that we have, is in some ways premised on the role that India can play balancing China. Um, the U.S. is very concerned about China's rise under the idea of, of um, return to great power competition. And so to the extent that India is really focused inward, it's less able, perhaps, to play that role and pay attention to what China is up to in the Indo-Pacific region. Within Pakistan, um, as I was mentioning, there's a risk that it is distracted from the constructive role it's playing in Afghanistan by the potential for Kashmir conflict. We have
haven't necessarily seen this so far, um, but if Pakistan ceases to pressure the Taliban to come to the table and negotiate, that could really stall out efforts to reach a settlement in Afghanistan. Also, if there were an actual conflict in Kashmir or significant violence breaking out, Pakistan would likely redeploy a lot of the troops that right now are on its western border with Afghanistan over to the eastern side. And so in terms of what that could do for security in Afghanistan, it could be particularly difficult um, and just another dynamic to watch. Finally, um, in the search for silver lining, which is sometimes targeted to buy for South Asia, um, there is a very slight chance for re-engagement. I think there's a lot of anger on both sides um, after this decision was taken. But it's always impossible to rule out. And one thing that we do have in Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Khan are two largely popular populist leaders. Um, and so if the script were to shift, um, if we were to see some sort of kind of surprise effort towards reconciliation and all of branch of sorts, I think they're well positioned domestically to be able to play that role if they choose to do so. Finally, some of you might remember this picture. This was from uh, that's Prime Minister Imran Khan on the left there, his July visit to the White House. It was at this meeting that President Trump um, made shockwaves in the region by offering to mediate uh, between India and Kashmir, or between India and Pakistan on the Kashmir issue. It was a huge diplomatic coup for Pakistan, and India was uh, quite concerned. So what does that mean for U.S. policy? Um, despite that offer, which President Trump has repeated a couple of times, he's kind of walked back his language. So now it's only if both sides are looking for assistance with mediation. And I think the, the chances that India would invite in the U.S. to mediate on this issue are slim to none. So we're not likely to see much out of that. Um, in terms of U.S. policy, though, I think recognizing the restrained role that Pakistan has played so far and calling for continued restraint by Pakistan is key. Um, all that we need at this point is kind of a tinderbox um, and any sort of crisis trigger that could be driven by a Pakistan Harvard militant group um, could be disastrous. Also, I think the U.S. should be expressing caution um, towards India over any sort of further inflammatory action. So that could be social policy, that could be steps that it would take in Kashmir, um, really just trying to, uh, to tamp down the actions of both sides in that regard. Um, the U.S. should be mindful to recognize the connection um, and potential fallout between as I was mentioning, a negotiated settlement in Afghanistan and what its impact could be in Kashmir. We have the history of um, the Russian withdrawal from Afghanistan. There were a number of fighters that came over to Kashmir, um, and as well as just the propaganda victory that some sort of settlement could create. So that's not to say that we shouldn't strike a negotiated settlement in Afghanistan, but just to be mindful that that will have broader regional implications. Um, second to last point is to prepare for managing the next crisis. So recognize if and how developments in Kashmir have changed the, the crisis narrative to both sides and kind of the choreography that we've seen develop and think through in advance how the U.S. has a third party crisis manager who would assist both sides from escalating. And then finally, I think the goal would have to be there. Um, it might be unlikely, but the U.S. should be attentive for opportunities and potential spots between both sides. So one example that I would point out um, to try to end on a, a more optimistic note, um, even after this August 5th decision was taken, we did see cutoffs in any sort of, you know, the limited remaining ties that both sides had. So they were called their ambassadors, that sort of thing. Um, but even in this very antagonistic environment, one India-Pakistan
um, initiative did continue on as scheduled, um, and it's called the Guitar Core Corridor. It's a corridor that links um, an area in India with an area in Pakistan, um, and that allows um, practitioners of the Sikh faith from India to cross the border to a famous shrine um, that is in Pakistan. And this has been something that both sides have been trying to do for quite some time, and it was an initiative of Pakistan's prime minister who really pushed this through. And it might seem like a small thing, but the fact that people from India are able to cross through this special corridor into Pakistan to visit the religious site, particularly in the, in the heightened tensions after August 5th, I think it's something to look at, um, and it might be a little bit of a silver lining in an otherwise um, fraught situation. So I will leave it at that. Um, thank you so much for your attention and your patience with the uh, tech issues that we had. And I did want to pass along, in addition to my email address, you're welcome to follow up with me. Um, but SouthAsianVoices.org is the website of that policy platform that I was mentioning for fantastic analysis and a variety of regional voices on politics, security, and economics. Nuclearlearning.org is the site for the online courses that we have on strategic issues in South Asia. They're free and anyone can sign up, so I love to do so. And then Simpson.org is the website for the Simpson Center if you want to learn more about what we do here. And that's it. Thank you, Elizabeth. We got some questions for you uh, on, on the talk, and um, I'm going to try to combine some that are kind of similar, but we'll, we'll try to get all of these asked of you. Uh, we don't want to keep you here too late. Um, so the first one, I, first one I have is, um, why is Kashmir so important to the area, and do you think there will ever be a possibility of a, the Kashmir region becoming an independent state? Hmm. Good question. Um, so in terms of its importance to the region, part of this is what I was talking about in terms of how beautiful it is. Um, it's kind of a unique part of the regional geography. Um, and I think because of the legacy of the way that India and Pakistan split from one another in 1947 through partition, it's come to have a much more significant symbolic meaning um, because it is seen as this piece of that process um, that hasn't been finished. And so both sides have a claim to it. They fought several wars over it. Um, but just listening to the language that both sides use when they describe it, Pakistan talks about Kashmir as its jugular vein. Um, because they see the protection of this Muslim-majority region as being in Pakistan's national interest and to be their responsibility in a way. Um, and so I think not just those demographic factors, the geographic factors, but more than that, what Kashmir has come to represent between the two sides, um, it almost has this kind of tug-of-war dynamic to it where... It is both about Kashmir itself, but it's also about more than that. It's about what Kashmir represents in terms of the broader India-Pakistan rivalry. Um, on the question about Kashmir's independence, um, I personally don't think that that is a viable option. Um, Kashmir, with its population of 12 million people, um, it's a relatively small geographic area. Um, you know, Pakistan has a population of, of over 200 million people, and India, last I saw, is at about 1.4 billion. Um, so it would be a very, very small state in between two much larger states um, that have long been fighting over it, essentially. Um, I think one interesting potential future, um, rather than full-on independence for Kashmir, is significant autonomy. Um, and that's one reason why the revocation of Article 370 is so significant, because rather than actually giving Kashmir more autonomy and more ability to dictate its own affairs, um, it holds it back closer to the center of the Indian state. 
I think another thing to keep in mind is it's not just on the India side. We've been focused much more on India's administered Kashmir today, but within Pakistan, there are also areas of the country that are within the broader Kashmir conflict. And so one thing that I would like to see going forward is a consideration of how you can start to build bridges between Kashmiri communities on both sides of the line of control. Um, within or between both India and Pakistan, there were some talks along those lines um, back in the early 2000s. And unfortunately, those ended up um, not coming to anything in part because of the 2008 attack in Mumbai. Um, but part of what was under consideration in that plan was some sort of kind of loosening of borders so that people from Kashmir would be able to pass a little bit more easily between the Indian side and the Pakistani side. And I think that might be a useful kind of middle ground to think about short of full-on independence, um, but maybe a strengthened autonomy with softened borders. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two questions together. Uh, I'll read the first one and then um, transition to the second. I'll maybe let you, actually, I think what I'll do, I'll read the first one, let you respond to that, and then I'll add the second one. Um, okay. would, you, would you agree that the good relationship between Modi and President Trump ensures protection against a nuclear war? Mm -hmm. um, I wish the answer were yes. I do not think that that is necessarily enough insurance um, given the catastrophic risk of nuclear war. Um, they certainly do have a close relationship, and in fact, it's not just with Prime Minister Modi, it's also with Prime Minister Imran Khan, um, who also got on very well with President Trump. I think that's a useful dynamic to remember. Um, so you could imagine in some sort of a crisis scenario when the president would get on the phone with both sides and, and essentially say, cool it. Um, but one of the really scary things about crises in South Asia is you have to think about not just deliberate escalation, um, so the risk of one side deciding to use one of these weapons against another, but also the risk of uncontrolled, accidental, inadvertent escalation. Um, and that something got, you know, went wrong in the communications. There was a breakdown of command and control. Um, and for some reason, even though no one intended it to be the case, we do see some sort of, of nuclear use or some sort of military action that would lead to nuclear use. Um, and so I think, again, given the risk of what that would represent, not just as the first use of a nuclear weapon since World War II, but also the human cost and the environmental cost there, um, it's not enough to just rely on close personal relationships between leaders of, of all sides. We really need to work on confidence building measures between both sides um, and improving, for example, lines of communication so that there's a hotline that effectively works between both sides. There's more than one kind of point of failure in this conversation. Um, and one of the, the unfortunate things about how tense the situation is right now is those confidence building measures and those fail safes um, are few and far between between the two sides. Okay. I'm actually going to hold off on the second one because that refers to economic policies. But there was a question referring back to the nuclear discussion. Um, what is your level of concern over terrorist, insurgent, or other non state actors accessing either Pakistani or Indian nuclear weapons? Yep. This has long been um, a concern of the U.S. and other international observers. I think, you know, I'm not privy to the classified assessments of both sides' material security um, and nuclear security protocols. Um, I think overall the security situation, certainly in Pakistan, has stabilized over the past few years. 
within the last 10 years in Pakistan, we've seen an 85% decrease in the number of terrorist attacks. And thinking back just a few years, just over 10 years ago, um, when Taliban-affiliated militants were within 60 kilometers of Islamabad, um, that is a far cry, happily, from where things are right now in Pakistan. Um, Both sides, publicly and privately, assure interlocutors that um, they take the, the security of nuclear weapons very seriously, that they do see this as a risk. But I think always with weapons of this type and with nuclear technology in general, um, it's really important to keep in mind that these are dangerous materials and they're also difficult materials to keep track of. This is not an easy thing to do. And unfortunately, even in the U.S. And, and elsewhere, we've seen a number of accidents and close calls uh, that have happened with nuclear materials. And so even as good as those systems may be, and I certainly um, hope they are, and you know, thank goodness nothing has, has happened so far, um, I don't think we can have 100% certainty in the security of nuclear materials um, anywhere, quite frankly, and that the, the risk is such that we always need to be mindful um, of steps that can be taken to better secure nuclear weapons. Okay. Um, would, you, would you agree that the economic policies discussed at the UN and in Houston will contain China and Russia's attempts to influence the region? I mean, that is one of the bigger questions of the day. Um, So the idea of the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, where a partnership between the U.S. and India is seen as kind of a counterweight or a counterbalance to the rise of China. Um, The U.S. has been making this bet for over a decade now. Um, And I think with some returns, but perhaps not enough returns or at least the, to meet the expectation that the policymakers who, who made this big bet were hoping for um, back in the middle of the last decade. So in terms of the actual economic deals that are under consideration right now, um, the analysis that I have read actually says that the, the deals that are under consideration are pretty minimal. Um, Interestingly, before the Howdy Modi summit in Houston, um, there had been a rumored U.S. and India trade agreement um, that was supposed to be signed before that, um, uh, before Modi's visit actually took place. That didn't happen, um, and it's still up for consideration. Um, you can read about press reporting of a few holdups. Um, we are anticipating a visit by President Trump to India at the end of this month. And so that will be one deliverable to watch for out of that visit is what sort of an agreement, if any, we do have on economic issues. But again, the analysis that I've read, um, at least according to to public information, says that that is not going to be a very significant um, trade agreement. I think more broadly in terms of the Indo-Pacific strategy, it's important to keep in mind that India itself shares a border with China. Um, but India has interest in maintaining a little bit of a balance between both sides. So doing enough to build its partnership with the U.S. Um, and gain, for example, through technology transfers and uh, purchasing weapon systems, economic concessions, those sorts of things. But it's not... Um, as deeply invested in its partnership with the U.S. as the U.S. is with India. I think the U.S. wants this a little bit more right now um, because India doesn't want to jump fully into the U.S. camp knowing that it shares a border with China, which also incidentally is contested and unsettled. Um, And so borders in the region um, remain a flashpoint, and it's not just India's western border that it has to be concerned with. It's also its its border with China in the east. Do you have any idea of uh, Pakistanis in the United States being involved in support of terrorism against the U.S.? Um, I am not an expert on 
domestic terrorism um, or terrorism carried out here, there have certainly been a few one-off cases, but compared to the overall size of the diaspora, um, it's an infinitesimal number. Um, but I would refer you probably to other experts who study um, the incidents that have taken place here in the U.S. Uh, a bit more closely than I do since I used to, I tend to focus on the region itself versus what's going on here. Okay. Do you believe that Imran Khan had any involvement in the assassination of Benazir Bhutto in 2007? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Um. <laughs> Do you, well, I'll just kind of, do you think uh, that Kashmir would actually elevate to the point of war and be worth a conflict between India, Pakistan, or even China? I think it, it, it depends on whether the better angels of, you know, the nature of, of Indian and Pakistani leaders would prevail. So, like I was mentioning before, it's not just the decision to deliberately escalate, but the potential for uncontrolled escalation that we have to think about. Um, but Kashmir, as I was mentioning, is one of those issues that is just of such central symbolic importance um, to all sides in that conflict. As you were seeing with the poll numbers, you know, 95 percent of Pakistanis condemned the decision that India took. And particularly if we were to start to see some sort of protest or violence or state repression of protesters in Kashmir, the, the tricky thing is it's going to get increasingly difficult for Pakistan's government to maintain a restrained response, to not take some sort of action um, and just to stay in the diplomatic realm, which it has so far. Um, on the Indian side, the Modi government now has a lot invested in Kashmir. Um, this is in some ways a bet that the Indian government has made that by bringing Kashmir in from its autonomous status into the mainstream, that development and security will improve in the region. Um, and so it's deeply invested in Kashmir. And if we were to see kind of the outbreak of protest, it could be politically embarrassing um, for the, the Modi administration. That's another dynamic that could feed into the potential for conflict over the region. In terms of China's role, um, I think it, it largely does want to maintain calm between both sides. Um, one important thing to remember is that on Pakistan side, so the, the areas of the Kashmir region that Pakistan controls, those are actually some of the most crucial areas for Chinese investment in Pakistan. So the region that's called Gilgit Baltistan, um, if you all remember from the presentation on the Pakistani side, that is the land connection between Western China into Pakistan and out to the sea route that China is trying to develop in order to create a, an easier and shorter connection to the sea. And so if we were to see some sort of military action in, in Kashmir or a crisis there, China has a lot to lose um, if those investments that it's made in the Pakistan side of Kashmir were to be compromised. Um, and so that could play out a couple of ways, right? That could be China putting pressure on both sides to keep a lid on things and de-escalate, or um, it could be accidentally playing a more escalatory role, um, where it's yet another player and we get into a situation where you, you almost have too many cooks in the kitchen, right? The U.S. is trying to contain things, China is trying to contain things, but maybe messages are mixed along the way. Um, so it just becomes a more complicated situation and a potentially more dangerous one as well. Okay. Um, what kind of work did you do in the Foreign Service, and what are you currently researching at the Stimson Center? All right. Um, so in the Foreign Service, I was a political officer, um, and the work that I did in Pakistan, I was actually doing both political and economic work. Um, so I did two years in Pakistan, and I split my time between the capital in Islamabad and Peshawar in the Northwest. 
So when I was there, I was focusing on the politics and economics of the province where Peshawar is located, called the Khyber Pakhtunwa province. And I was also focused along the western border region. This is really sometimes known as the tribal areas of Pakistan or FATA. Um, and this is a region that has been key in terms of counterterrorism issues, um, in terms of the situation in Afghanistan, because it's where um, a number of Taliban and terrorist groups are, are widely rumored to have been hiding out. And it was also an area where Pakistan's military was undertaking a major military operation uh, while I was there. So my focus was largely on covering those issues. Um, I also covered issues involving um, women and minorities in the region um, and how they were being treated. And I was very fortunate before I went to Pakistan to have done eight months of language training. So I learned Pashto, the local language in that part of, of Pakistan and part of Afghanistan as well before I went out, um, which allowed me to um, do my job more effectively and, and speak to folks who are not just kind of the typical English-speaking elite. Uh, which was great. Uh, before I was in Pakistan, I worked in Monterey, Mexico, and there I was a consular officer. So I was doing interviews for people who wanted to visit the U.S. on a tourist visa or for business or to make investments, um, and also for temporary workers who were coming up to work in agriculture um, and other endeavors on visas. I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? What's your current research at the Stimson Center is focused on? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, we just got back from a trip to the region, so that's a big part of it. Um, and we have been kind of unpacking and trying to get a sense of what we learned and what's going to be um, our focus moving ahead. One of the things that I am focusing a little bit more on is the situation in Afghanistan and what might happen in terms of negotiations there with the Taliban and the Afghan government and how that would impact Afghanistan, certainly, but also the wider region. So I was referring to this a little bit in uh, the parts of the presentation where I was talking about the um, potential for a Taliban propaganda victory to inspire um, other insurgent and militant groups across the region. So that's one thing I've been thinking through is how the situation in Afghanistan how those changes there could um, have kind of a ripple effect across South Asia. I've also been thinking a little bit about um, the situation with borders on both sides. I think this came out during my talk um, on the, the LOC and potential kind of pragmatic steps forward, uh, keeping in mind the admonition that we have from Stenson for pragmatic steps towards ideal objectives trying to identify what some of the, maybe the low-hanging fruit for CBM's confluence building measures between both sides that will hopefully stand us in, in a firmer footing um, when we do um, run into the next crisis, if there is a next crisis. Um, and finally, I've been working on China's role in the region to a certain extent. Um, I spent some time in China and I'm a Chinese speaker as well. and so. I've been trying to dust off my Mandarin and think through um, a little bit more about what China's role in South Asia could look like. It's a particularly interesting set of issues because I think even in the context of um, the pretty tense U.S.-China relationship that we're seeing more broadly now, South Asia is actually a rare area of overlap of interest between the two sides. So there's been some cooperation between China and the U.S. and Afghanistan. And I think it's, it's interesting to think through how we might build on that, um, given the relationships that China has with Pakistan, the U.S. has with India as well. Okay. And last question is, have you seen the movie Hotel Mumbai, and what is your perception of the treatment of the L.E.T. terrorist in the movie? Oh, I wish I could answer that one. It's actually been on my queue for a while now, and I haven't gotten to watch it. Um, so I will have to take a rain check on that, but I can follow up, up with you when I do. Okay, very good. Well, Elizabeth, thank you again for your time. We really appreciate that.